Okay. Okay. We're on. <coughs> yes, sir. All right. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, welcome everybody uh, to our first seminar of uh, the semester and the year, of course. And uh, it's a double pleasure to have here today uh, Dr. Cox from uh, SAS. He's uh, the manager of the uh, text uh, um, mining group. Te text miner for the yeah, SAS text miner. Yeah, the, the text miner at SAS. Uh, he, uh, he got his PhD in cognitive psychology and computer science from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, he's been uh, leading a lot of the efforts at SAS in uh, uh, mining and learning in, uh, in many different uh, uh, contexts. And we also have uh, Dr. Alan Shaw, uh, who's uh, uh, who got his degree from uh, Harbin Institute of Technology, and uh, uh, his PhD from uh, Arizona State, who joined, I guess, SAS three years ago, you said, right? Yes. And uh, who's also in uh, the same group uh, as uh, Dr. Cox. And uh, they'll be talking about their, uh, a lot of, actually, a lot of the interesting stuff that they're doing at SAS. And today, in particular, uh, Dr. Cox will start out with uh, the approaches for large and sparse feature sets, for working with large uh, uh, sparse feature sets. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. The floor is yours. OK. Um, can, is, it, is the mic working? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so basically, um, as a peace offering, I'm wearing red, so. Um. <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's right, yes. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, one of the things that I've been struck with, it, and this is why I did this talk, is that one of the things that's very interesting is that you read a paper on genomics and people will talk about, oh, well, we have the SNP data and all that, and so we've developed this new technique to work with it. And then you'll see something about text mining, and people say, we've developed this new technique to work with text mining and all this stuff. And so... One of the things that I really think it's very useful is if we can work across these different places and say, hey, we can bring these techniques, you know, have some kind of a general strategy for how do we work with sparse data. So that's what I'm going to address today. And um, hopefully we'll get a chance to hear Alan at the end. Um, partly that depends on how many questions I get. But, um, and he'll be talking about um, feature extraction. So. So um, that's right. This is what I use. Let's see. You can use your fingers. So. Okay, I'll try that. The high tech way. Okay. So generally, when I talk about sparse feature sets, what I'm talking about is situations where you have, you know, in thousands to millions of features, um, and there's actually a lot of applications that have millions of features. But and the other thing is where most of these features are not true about any particular object or, or don't have a value for any particular object. So generally 80 to 99.99 percent sparsity. And um, it turns out that there's a whole lot of applications that this applies to. Um, so, you know, one, basically, and one of the things that we can think about is that sparse tables is one aspect of that. So you can think about where you have um, many columns for each row and there's different scales you know and a lot of this might be missing data you know what's historically been ta called missing data of course when you're talking about 80 percent sparsity then um, then missing data is difficult to account for so if you since they have different scales it's also difficult to work with them in in some any kind of context so the general the general thing that people look at when they're dealing with sparse data is the sparse matrix. So this would be, could be thought of similar to the sparse table where instead of there being different scales, each column has the same scale of measurement, basically. So this scale might be binary, so just one zero might be counts, um, where basically a missing element <coughs> means that you've got a count of zero. They can be ordinal. Um, and they can be continuous. In the ordinal and continuous case, the, um, the data might be considered zero, but they also might be considered missing values. So in the case of where there are missing values, then, um, then there has to be some way of saying, okay, well, if we've got 99% sparsity, how do we deal with 
these missing elements, you know, obviously typical ways of imputing missing values is not going to work in that context. But there turns out to be some interesting ar algorithms looking at that. So, um, and the final thing is, is that if you start with a sparse table, you can still end up with a sparse matrix because you can tra transform the data. So if you have, say, a field that has um, 20 different values, then you can uh, d what's called dummying the values. So you can say, okay, I'm going to treat each one of those values as a separate binary variable. And so you can then treat it as a sparse matrix um, with, you know, tw 20, in that case, 20 different binary values. And if you've got, say, 10 different fields that each have a varying number, then each one of those fields, each one of those values becomes a separate var variable in, say, your um, sparse binary matrix in that, that situation. So even when we start with a sparse table, we can still apply these kinds of sparse matrix techniques for working with them. So that's the general idea of what we're talking about and the different forms of this data, as I mentioned. So, so the, there's a number of application areas where this actually applies. So it might sound very specific what I'm talking about, but it turns out that it's really rampant in the type of data we want to analyze today. And, one, and so one particular area that I, is particularly close to my heart is the area of text. So um, typically what you have is that with text, if we run a million documents through, we might find 100,000, 200,000 distinct terms in those million documents. Um, so that, you know, there, there we've got a feature set basically of 100,000 or 200,000 variables if you're looking at terms by documents. And um, the great majority of those are going to be sparse, most likely greater than 99% sparse in that example. Genomics is another area where this is really key, and particularly when you're talking about um, genes and SNPs, um, the proteins, the CGAT or whatever, you know, that underlie the proteins and genes, is that you're gonna, if you're comparing two sets of SNPs, then the vast majority of the values are going to be the same, you know, and, and, you know, you're really only interested in the things that differ. And so those differences become your sparse data. And we're going to see that this differencing actually in a number of different situations leads to the sparse data. It's, it's, for example, image processing is another way with that. So, you know, a lot of times, if, so if you're doing a video, uh, you're, you say you've got a motion vic video and you're trying to determine what's going on there, is that the very common thing is to subtract out one image from another to see, okay, how do these images differ? And so once you've subtracted those images, you've got a sparse feature set because you've only got particular pixels that have changed. And the great majority of pixels are, may be exactly the same or whatever level you're working at. It might not be pixels. It might be something else. Um, recommendation engines. So um, like Netflix, you know, all the, if you think of like movie reviews, well, there's thousands of movies out there, but um, most people have not rated thousands of movies um, or any appreciable fraction of the movies on Netflix. So if you're trying to determine what movies to recommend somebody to see, and this would apply to other kind of recommendation engines as well, like what, what kind of ads do you present somebody, you know, and so forth in a, in a web environment, then you have to deal with this issue in the recommendation engines that um, you've got to fill, figure out this missing data. And I'll talk later about actually where that missing value thing I talked about earlier applies very much in the case of recommendation engines because if they don't have a movie rated, that doesn't mean they hated the movie. It means that they um, just didn't give a rating on the movie. And then item purchase data. So you think it takes something like an Amazon catalog and you want to know, okay, what are the patterns of buying behaviors that people do? What are the collections? If they're buying this, what else are they buying and so forth? You could have thousands of different products and once again that's sparse. Um, and that's also been technically referred to as market basket data, um, because it could be just it could be a Walmart or any shop or any grocery store or whatever. Web logs, again, web logs. You have a um, variety of websites. The vast majority of them that people aren't going to. You have sparse data there. Sensor data um, is is a very common case where you're again dealing with this kind of um, sparse data. So there's. And I'm just got that dot 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 because I'm sure I didn't think of everything. And um, basically, what we're finding is that just about every area, there's something that you can identify where there's sparse, these very large sparse feature sets that that really need to be looked at. Um, 
So, so, what, so we know there's a lot of application areas, and one of the things that I think, as I mentioned before, is that people will take one application area and they'll invite, invent entirely new techniques to work with that application area. These techniques can be across, but the thing is, is that this is what I'd like to see more, is that instead of everybody going off and on their own saying, hey, let's, this is a cool way to represent this, how do you do this in common across these different data sources? So, what, the first thing I want to look at is how do you go about constructing a sparse matrix? Because if you take the dense case where you're representing in the dense and you've got 99% sparsity, that's going to be a very in inefficient way to represent a sparse matrix. So probably the predominant way when you're constructing or updating one is to use a hash table called dictionary of keys where you're doing a hash table where you've got the row and the column as the key field in the hash table and the value then is the the value that you're looking for. The other one that sometimes used is a list of lists where you've got um, the list that they might be referenced by a cache table, but then as you go across the, the um, row, basically the columns themselves are done in, a, in an incremental fashion. Um, the, so, and, and this is, I think the dictionary of keys is generally the better technique, but some people still use a list of lists in doing that. But those ways of dealing with it are not very efficient for actually performing the matrix operations. So these become ways that, um, that people can build sparse matrices or update sparse matrices, but they're not very effective for doing matrix processing. And so there's other types of um, ways of actually storing the matrices that lend themselves to actually um, doing the matrix operations. So a lot of times people will transform their matrices from that form when they're using it to build it and then into this, these other forms when they want to operate on it. Um, so let's, I'm going to talk about some assumptions here in terms of what we're going to assign um, M by N. So we've got a sparse matrix that's M rows and N columns. Um, actually, it's N, I got it backwards. It's N rows and M columns. K, where we're we're going to say there's K non-zeros. Um, S is the element size. So um, in the case of a uh, if, if you've got counts, then you probably can represent it very nicely in an int. Um, it, in some cases, counts, if they're very small, you might even be able to represent them in a byte. You know, if it, you know they're never going to go past 255. And so um, this element size is flexible. Now, if you're talking about a binary sparse matrix, interestingly enough, S becomes zero because um, just the fact, in the way that these normally get represented, um, it, for most of the representations, S is zero because all you're distinguishing is if it's there, it's one. If it's not, it's zero. So you don't actually ha even have to represent the element. And the B is going to be the number of bytes required for these different representations. So first of all, if you take, talk about a completely dense matrix, one of the reasons I put 80% earlier is that if you have, there is overhead in terms of storing the sparse matrix. So if you're... Um, if you're dealing with 50% sparsity, it may be ideal just to go ahead and use a dense representation. Um, but when you're dealing with upwards of 50% sparsity, certainly in the 80% range at that point, you almost certainly want to have some kind of compressed representation. So the dense representation is going to be M times N times S. The, um, the second form that's called is the coordinate representation. And in this one, what you do is you have each row has a column index, a row index, and a value. So the um, value is going to take s, s bytes. The, um, assuming that our row and column can be represented less than 4 billion, um, so it, it, assuming that the, we know we've got less than 4 billion, row, 4 billion something rows and columns, then we can represent it in 4 bytes. And so in that case, there become, you have to represent those two. So you have 8 plus S times your number of non-zeros that gets represented, that's required for that representation. The second one that we've got, the next one is this compressed sparse row um, organization. That's where you have, um, essentially you have an index that is the, um, that contains, so you have an array that has all the values in your, in your structure. Then you have another array that has the first value it has the index of the first um, column for a particular row that's being used. And then the third one, um, what, was, what is the third one, Alan? I'm trying to remember what the third array sh does. Let's say 
No, you, 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 still need, uh, you still need a third one. But at any rate, the amount of storage requirements are much... Maybe, maybe it is two that's... Because the, the storage requirements then are 4K plus NS. So um, essentially then you've got... N is the, so the number of rows you've got, so it's going to be um, that... N whoops. That number that um, is being applied, plus you have the... Um, plus you're going to store every element, which we're saying... And, Assuming that the element can, I'm sorry, no, ns is the number, is the um, size of the array. And anyway, it, it turns out it's 4k plus ns, which is generally less than what you've got with coordinate. And then the next form that actually shows some reduction is um, called block storage. So remember when I talked earlier about, okay, as long as you've got 4 billion rows and columns, you can store the row and column index um, in 4 bytes. Um, well, if you had 256 of each, then you can store those indexes in one byte. And so this block storage turns out to be an effective form of storing, particularly when you're storing data across a grid of machines, um, because then you can put a particular block on one machine. You know, each block goes on one machine, and so you're basically indexing the blocks, and then within those blocks, you're indexing the row and the column just with one byte each. So um, the, that generally shows the best compression of any of these. Um, and it also, um, and I've got a reference here that, um, that basically talks about this and about the storage savings. Um, ten, tends to be, depending on the data, anywhere from 50% to 100% of what's needed for the compressed sparse row. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is compressed sparse row, you can do the, if m is less than n, then it actually saves more space to do what's called compressed sparse column, where you do exactly the same thing except you're doing it column-wise instead of row-wise. And that's called CSC. But this, this, um, th this particular form is particularly useful for doing matrix operations when you're doing them across a grid. So it tends to save more space, um, not a whole lot of space, but some space over CS CSR, and it can be done. It's nice for working matrix operations across the grid. So one of the things that, so I've got links in this presentation, so at some point I want to see how I can put my slides on a common or some place where everybody can get them. So that way if you want to take a look at those links, we can. If there's any questions at the end, I can dive into the links or whatever too. So um, they usually are put on the web anyway. Okay. So sparse matrix operations. Um, so Remember, I talked about that storage for operations. So let's talk about how, how we go about doing these operations. So first of all, element-wise operations are generally pretty simple to do. You just, you know, you're just going to go linearly through the list and apply that element-wise to whatever it is, and the representation really doesn't matter a whole lot as long as you can get sequential access. Um, matrix multiplication becomes more complicated, and there's two forms here. One is where you're multiplying two sparse matrices together, and the other where you're doing sparse and dense. And I didn't include vector multiplication here, but vector mu multiplication can just be considered a simplification of matrix multiplication, although there are sometimes some techniques that can be somewhat faster if you're just multiplying vectors. Um, I didn't want to go into that much detail on this. But um, solvers is the next thing. So um, you know, how do you solve an equation like AX equals B? Basically, it's like a pseudo-inverse or whatever. Um, and then the matrix decomposition, um, for example, eigenvector decomposition, but there's other types of matrix decompositions um, where you're trying to get a nature of what, you know, what's the, what's the patterns, what's the commonality that you've got within this matrix. Um, so all these, um, there's, there's quite a bit of literature that defines how to go about doing these s simple matrix operations across the sparse ones and I get across the sparse matrix. And in fact, there's packages in various software for doing just that. So um, if you look at Python, so you can get a Skype is something that um, is, a, is a scientific Python, basically. It's a um, collection of routines that include routines for working with sparse matrices. Um, in MATLAB, there's, a, there's something in MATLAB for sparse matrix operations. Um, and it uses, a, so MATLAB it basically uses, I think, a CSC representation. Um, most so you know, you're, it's sort of fixed to that representation. But once it's in that representation, you can 
um, use that package for doing that. And uh, Skype actually supports several different representations, including the block representation for representing sparse matrices. Um, sparse M package for R is similar to the you know, restrictions for MATLAB. I think it's a one, one form of storage of the sparse matrix. It obviously is easier if you're, if for the routines if they're only dealing with one form that the sparse matrix might be stored in. Um, and in SAS, there's two, two, two things that we have that, that support um, sparse matrix um, solvers and multipliers and so forth. PROC IML supports that and um, has some sparse routines. Now, it uses a COO representation for its sparse matrix. So, um, it, you know, that's the, that's the one, the simple one where row column value entry. Um, and then PROC OP model can do, can, it is a, a PROC OP model is used for um, solvers in general, for any kind of um, solver that you're trying to do, uh, very flexible in terms of getting a solution um, with various, conver you know, convergence and so forth. And so it also supports sparse matrices, I think, in the COO form um, that I mentioned before. So, um, so we are at the point now where we have these sparse matrix packages, but um, one of the things that, that these are all set up for use on a single machine, and mostly single-threaded through here. So um, that's one of the issues that we're at, because if we talk about Okay, I don't know why my slide doesn't show up. I, okay, I made some changes this morning. I thought I'd added a slide, but it's not here. If you take something like the large hierarchical um, text categorization, LSHTC, large-scale hierarchical text categorization, um, we're dealing with situations there. That's, that's something that's currently um, being done, and we're actually trying to um, prepare a submission at SAS on working with that. But that's taking, like, three million Wikipedia articles with um, hundreds of thousands of categories and being able to categorize. Now here, we're not only talking about sparse data that's in the feature level, we're talking about sparse data that's in the, in the prediction level. So you're dealing with all these categories that, you know, where ca there can be overlap. They're not distinct categories. These are ones where they're not mutually exclusive. Multiple categories can be applied, but you've got hundreds of thousands of categories for millions of articles. So um, you know, that, that's, that's not something that's simple. You're not going to solve with the sparse M package or whatever on a single machine in any kind of um, reasonable time frame that size of a problem. So what you've got to do is figure out ways to scale this up. And so one of the things, one of the movements that's been done is, okay, a lot, very much they've looked at dense matrix operations with graphical processing units, you know, that you know, people have said, hey, we've got these fast processors that are being used in games that are perfect, that are basically matrix, doing matrix calculations. So let's take advantage of those. And now they've gone across to the sparse matrix, too. And so here's a couple of articles that are actually from just the past couple of years. Um, this is a really um, burgeoning research area in terms of um, doing, using GPUs for matrix um, multiplication and also for solvers. Um, and the second thing is, okay, so the, the second thing is doing parallel systems like MapReduce or basically where you've got a grid of machines and you want to, here it's, it's not just using the graphical processing units, although it might, but the idea is that you're performing these operations in parallel across a set of machines. And um, how do you, one of the problems here is how do you associate all of one column or one row to a single node? Because one of the important things, especially when you get into solvers, is that it becomes critical that, that you're able to operate at that row or column level. Um, and that's one of the things that's interesting is that there's a number of algorithms that have shown that you, can, you don't have to do that if you use the block storage um, scheme that I mentioned earlier. And so this is all really exciting work that's still in early stages. So if anybody's interested in those kinds of things, this is, this is an area that's really rife for, for development. Um, and so here's, one, here's an article about doing multiplication um, in, in this parallel nature. And then this, the solver, the ATS toolkit, this PET-SC, 
is one that's very actively being developed for, um, for this par large-scale parallel processing of matrix operations. Um, now, this is interesting is that PROC OP model, as I mentioned, so that's with SAS, is that um, in SAS 9.4, which is our most recent release of SAS 9.4, have SAS, they now have PROC OP model being able to use multiple threads. So if you've got um, an eight processor machine, it isn't that it goes across a grid at this point, but it will, it can use all pro eight processors in the way it goes about solving it. So there's some parallel solving type things, but it's not massively parallel, it's more limited parallel. Um, oh, okay, I put this in the wrong place. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is the large scale hierarchical text challenge I was talking about, where you've got categories of 325,000 in one of the problems and up to 2.4 million um, documents. So um, it really becomes important to be able to have these scalable approaches when you're dealing with these size problems. And um, certainly, you know, a lot of y'all are familiar with PRISM with NSA, is that I'm sure that they're having similar issues, you know, when you're talking about. So, you know, think of it this way. You can help the government really learn of more details about our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Intricate details. So, um, so one of, the, one of the things with doing that is that this is matrix operations, but one of the things is that you don't have these toolkits like, um, okay, you use um, SAS, and you've got dense data, you can do regressions, you can do neural networks, you can do support vector machine, you can do all these things, but they're all expecting dense, you know, standard tables. Okay, so you don't have, um, so where you've got the ability to do the matrix operations, this thing about having general toolkits, this is where I think that we need to move, is we need to have all the flexibility for um, going about solving our problems in the sparse world that we do in the dense world. So, um, the, so I want to take an example of, um, a couple of examples of how I see this kind of moving forward and what are some steps that can be done in this process. So I'm going to talk about like a d dense approach and contrast that with a sparse approach. So um, let's take, for example, um, principal components analysis. Okay, so um, is there, do most people know about principal components analysis in here? Is that, okay, good. So, um, so, you know, if you've got dense matrix principal components analysis, essentially what you're doing is you're doing an eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance or the correlation matrix um, of a set of variables. Okay, so, um, it basically, or the normalized x prime x. And the reason that I say it's normalized is that if you're using the covariance matrix, then it's dividing by the standard deviation. If you're doing the correlation matrix, it's also subtracting off the mean. The advantage of this is that you don't want, you know, some of your attributes having huge effects just because the scale that you're using is, um, you know, has a much larger variance. And so generally subtracting the mean too means that they're centered in the same location, so it, you can make sense of that data. Um, so in the sparse case, so with text, for example, we, we developed um, a sparse matrix um, singular value decomposition um, a while back for working with um, text data, but it could work with any kind of the sparse data. It doesn't have to be just text. Um, and our implementation uses the Lansos algorithm, and we have a proc called proc SPSVD that's released as part of SAS TextMiner. Um, and then also we recently have released, in the past couple of years, um, we've released proc HPTMine, and the primary author of proc HPTMine is Alan over here. So, um, he, so he's, he's the expert on that. So um, what this is, um, distributes this calculation across the grid um, with this p parallel, and so what it does is that it actually so does the solver in one machine, but the um, calculations for the matrix multiplication is done sparsely across a grid. So um, it has, a, so that, that is implemented across the grid, but the solver itself is done in a, in a single thread. Um, and so one thing we might look at in the future is just now that some of these solvers there's um, a lot of work that's been done on how do you distribute those. It's a lot harder to figure out how to distribute the solvers. Then, th then there's the opportunity to perhaps use that as well. Um, but the question is, well, how do you normalize this data? Okay, so 
you know, if you've got a sparse matrix, it's, you know, you, you, once you sub if you subtract off the mean, suddenly you've taken sparse data and you've made it dense. Um, and so we've already talked about if you've got, if you've got like in that um, data where you've got 325,000 um, columns and you've got 2.5 million rows, you're, gonna, you're not going to want to represent that densely. It's just not practical. So, um, so what, we t what, what is interesting is that some of the stuff that actually turns out to be very useful here um, actually has some of the same effects that, that subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation would have. For instance, we ha so if you do rare, one of the things that's found in text documents, for example, is what's called a rare word weighting technique. So this is where you say, okay, I'm going to divide by the inverse of the document frequency of the term, for example. Um, it turns out that what happens is that once you've done that, if you sum across the entire matrix for that row, guess what? Your sums now for each of the terms are going to be very similar because of that inverse document frequency. Your, your sums are going to be very close together. In essence, you've done something very similar to dividing by the standard deviation. The other thing is, is that a lot, a lot of this data might be 99 plus, 99% plus sparse. And so really, if you're looking at central tendency, maybe the mean isn't the best number. Maybe the mode, which is zero, is the best number to be considered as a central tendency. Um, the, and so that, that, that fits in with that. But um, also what's neat about this weighting is that you do tend to get, um, you didn't, do tend to get values that if you do, say, a TF-IDF weighting where you're taking the log of the time the number of that term occurs in a document dividing by the inverse document frequency, you did, do tend to get a distribution that's closer to Gaussian than you do from the original counts that you might have. So, um, so that's also something that functions in that. So in a way, what's happening is just these processes that have been discovered, whoops, forgot about that, that touching, um, <laughs> is that just, just these techniques that have been found over time to be useful for text are performing the same operation, essentially, that we're doing by subtracting the mean dividing by the standard deviation. Now, um, as I mentioned, this has been developed with text, but I'm talking about things that apply across data. So, um, oh, I'll, I'll, let me talk about this first. So, one of the things we then do is saying, okay, well, how do we take that singular value decomposition is essentially, just like a principal components analysis, the first dimension is accounting for the maximal variance in the data. Second dimension is orthogonal to first, that's taking the maximum variance that can be accounted for in one dimension, that's that's after subtracting off that first dimension and so forth. So, um, but, but it doesn't necessarily have semantic interpretability. And so it turns out that we found, found that, you know, just like with principal components analysis, you can rotate the factors to, um, to line up with important, you know, you know, more semantically meaningful things. You can do exactly the same thing with um, text, and that becomes topic analysis. And, in fact, that's what we use for our topic generation in, um, in, text, in SAS TextMiner. So we just rotate the SVD axes, just like you would rotate the principal components axes. Um, now, there's alternatives, and in fact, in the literature, you'll find these alternatives used much more often than what we're doing. So one of the, one, one of the things is, remember I talked about the scale of the data may have a role to play in what you do. So, if your data is non-negative, in the case of counts, then you know that your data is, is always non-negative. It's zero and up. So, um, so non-negative matrix factorization is an alternative approach that's been used to work. Again, uh, it actually came out of image, pro you know, looking at images, but has also been applied to text and some other things as well. Again, it kind of across these different domain. So maybe it's better to use non-negative matrix factorization since, since we're dealing with non-negative matrix. The other thing is, is that, well, since the matrix represents counts, why don't we use latent Dirichlet allocation? Those of you that know much about text know that, that when people talk about topics today, almost always they're talking about using latent Dirichlet allocation, which is the, essentially the Dirichlet um, distribution is the, corresponds to the point, to the, um, to the Poisson, is the Poisson that's doing the counts. So it's saying, okay, we're, we're effectively modeling the posterior of the counts by using the Dirichlet allocation, Dirichlet distribution with latent Dirichlet allocation. 
So isn't this, that going to be more effective than just using, say, um, this rotated SVD because it's, more, it's going to get better at the scale of the data that you're working with? Um, the, the problem is, is that when you move away from a linear model, which SVD essentially is, then you do have the problem that the solution space in both of those cases is no longer convex. And so you, you have the problem that you can fall into local minima. And um, it also, the processing can take considerably longer as it iterates towards a solution. Um, when you're, when you're, you, when you're um, converging in a, um, when you're doing convergence in a, in a space that's convex, where there's one global solution, you can rap more rapidly converge than when you're dealing with something that that is um, that that isn't as easy, you know. That you know, so generally you can do it faster. The um, so basically, one of the, we did some stuff where we we compared three different data sets, two standard data, data sets and one artificial data set, and we said how which of these three approaches generates better topics to replicate the structure in the data. And um, in the case of the artificial data, we could use the, um, we, we used what we, basically the way the data was formed, because we knew what patterns was in the data, so they knew what topics should be generated. In the case of um, the two real case data sets, we used um, the actual categorical variables in those data sets, and we found that they, they were more ra ra accurately reflected in the, um, in the rotated SVD than it was in either non-negative matrix factorization or latent Dirichlet allocation. Um, and what was interesting was that um, latent Dirichlet allocation um, has the problem that since your modeling directly counts, you can't do the rare word weighting as, as easily. In fact, um, so with, when you do the rare word weighting, we could do cons um, considerably better than what LDA was doing. We, we, even without doing rare word weighting, we, could, we did better. So, so this, this thing about the solution space not being convex, um, actually, co even though we're dealing with data that's not completely normally distributed and fits all our linear assumptions, that if you have enough of that data, it seems to do a pretty good job anyway. So, um, these, but these are the types of things that when you're looking through these uh, particular applications, you will want to evaluate these kinds of questions. You know, is it better to use a linear model that might be convex but, um, and, and quick to solve, or is, it, or is that going to give you difficulty because of the, scale of the scales that you're working with? So um, the other thing is, well, um, this has been found to be effective in text. But the question is, this is what I was saying, is that moving across these application domains, what if we're dealing with non-text data? Well, we found in the Netflix competition that um, people started using SVDs and they jumped right to the top. Um, in dealing with these recommendation engines. And so um, we found that that was very effective in that too, the sparse SVDs. The um, sparse SVDs have also been effective for um, computing what's called eigengenes in genomics. So um, you're determining that collections of genes that seem to have um, a similar effect, say, on the diseases and so forth. And, um, and here's a reference that you can look at as far as referencing that. So, um, so we see at least two other areas where people have used the same idea with success. And, uh, but why not also web log data, item purchase data? I would say that they're just as likely to be effective there, but because, again, we tend to deal with literature that comes from different places, not everybody reads the literature that goes across these domains. And so I think it's useful. That's why I think having these general practices can be useful. Um, now, the other interesting thing about this is that recommendation data, as I mentioned with the Netflix stuff, the, the trick here um, is that recommendation data should treat missing data as missing, not zero. So these text techniques I was talking about is where, zero, where you've got the missing data, zero is perfectly fine assumption to make for that. But when you're talking about recommendation data, it isn't a good assumption. And there's an article here that, um, that I referenced that, um, that actually uses as its model that it, as its error function. Its error function is based on these missing values as being actually missing values not, n that haven't been computed, not zeros. And um, it, it gets much better results than if you just apply the singular value decomposition to the recommendation data. And the PROC recommend at SAS is coming out at the end of the year, 
as part of our visual analytics platform. And that uses that new algorithm. So um, at SAS, we're, we're trying to take advantage of some of these new developments. Um, so the other thing is about what about sparse binary matrices? Remember I talked about binaries as a special case. You can actually save on the storage a lot when you're representing sparse binary matrices. It seems intuitive that when you're dealing with only two values, there ought to be some really great techniques for working with that data. And unfortunately, <laughs> um, people have not been finding that. In fact, um, non-negative matrix factorization has been, in some of the research, you know, seems to be the best, which doesn't necessarily take a real advantage of it being binary. But there's, so this is still an open question. This would be another area that might be very interesting to look into because a lot of this data is sparse binary. We can represent um, text data as sparse binary if all we care about is whether a term occurs. We can represent um, data such as the item purchase data or the web log data as, um, as, as binary sparse matrices. So, um, so there's a very interesting tutorial out there that I reference about the work that's been done there, but it is still an open question, and it's kind of puzzling to people why they're not, why we haven't at this point found any techniques that seem to work especially better with binary data. Um, so let's take um, a second example. And so a lot of you are familiar, may be familiar with what's called association data. So in, this was done with market basket data to say, okay, well, if somebody buys product A and product B, then we can predict that they're very likely to buy pro product C. So A and B implies C, um, or so forth. The beer and diapers thing, you know, finding that so the apocryphal thing about um, finding that they should put beer and diapers near each other because um, people were buying them together and stuff. So, um, so this association data is something that, again, this item purchase data, it's very much a um, sparse type of data. So um, if we're talking about dense data, this actually corresponds very closely to what in the dense data that you're talking about, about decision trees, where you're saying, okay, if I, I said A, you know, buying beer and diapers or whatever, so if I'm trying to see, I've got diapers and I want to know where to put diapers, I can generate a decision tree to see, okay, what are the, what are the different other things that are often bought together to predict that I'm going to buy um, diapers or beer or whatever it was that I was going to predict. So, um, so decision trees um, basically become association rules where you are dealing with a fixed consequence. So you have an antecedent and a consequent in, in um, association rules. Um, and um, so th there's lots of approaches. There's been some different applications of, um, of association rules in SAS, some procs that do that. And um, there's some stu a node in Enterprise Miner and so forth. A priori is one of the most famous of those. But it's actually not the most effective, it's just the oldest. Um, and we actually developed a, what we call Boolear algorithm that's working with that fixed consequent. But it's basically like doing decision trees except with sparse data. Much faster and it actually it generates much better results than if you apply decision trees after trying to densify that sparse data. So this is a good example where um, th this decision trees um, can be directly compared to um, something that works specifically with sparse data. And because uh, it can take advantage of the form of the sparse data, it can work much faster than trying to make it dense and then doing a decision tree. And, the, um, the, um, and so that, that, that algorithm is an example. Again, that's not specific to text. It could be used for item data. It could be used for web log data. It could be used for a variety of other types of data. But it is, it is assuming, bi assuming binary sparse data. So um, it only works for situations where you do have binary sparse. As I mentioned before, though, if you take dense data where you've got these columns that have a variety of different options, you can turn that into a sparse binary matrix. So, so questions? Any questions? Oh, no, no, because it's 15 you've minutes time. first. 15 minutes is too short. Right? Well, why don't you give a high level, a high level overview? You have 20 minutes. Okay.
So Alan's going to talk about dimensionality reduction, but um, as he's setting up, just any que any questions? I, 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 so I'll, thro I'll throw out one. So have any of you worked with sparse data? So um, what, what kind of techniques did you do when you work with sparse data? Um, I guess it wasn't quite sparse enough that I had to do any particularly special techniques, but I know that uh, one of the models I was using was storing the data sparsely. Yeah. And, and you? The sparse tools of the data I have is enough for MATLAB to handle, so actually I don't need to develop some certain techniques for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, just, it's, just, it's just the same case for me, and uh, I applied a lot of uh, matrix decomposition on the sparse data I have. So what what wrong kind of what form is the sparse data in that that you are using? I just use the MATLAB toolbox. No, no, I mean, is it is it text data, genomics data? Um, for me, it's image data. Image data, okay. For me, it's social network data. Social network. And we got a text data. It was GigaWord. Text data. Text data. Yeah. Use wire. Okay. Anybody else use sparse data? Um, if you're interested, if you're looking for something that has what I think might be far-reaching impact, I think that's a good area to look at. I might be biased. <laughs> yeah, I think from a uh, from student perspective, typically, you know, we're basically doing exa exemplars to basically Get the paper written. And right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Congrats. So you Congrats. say, okay, I'm going to take a subset. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Alan. Uh, my name is Zheng. You can call me Alan. Uh, so the, uh, the, the presentation uh, I, will, uh, I will give today is about uh, like a uh, distributed parallel feature selection algorithm. Uh, we implement this algorithm as a uh, SAS high performance uh, procedure called HP Reduce. Uh, so since I don't have much uh, time, I will give you a very br brief introduction about this algorithm. Uh, so at the beginning of uh, my presentation, I want to give you a little bit of motivation about the feature selection. So why feature selection is uh, very important. So as data miners may know, uh, a predictive modeling process in data mining is actually a never-ending cycle about uh, modeling, predicting, and discovering. For example, you are given a data. So you want to first build a model. Then after you have this model, you want to do some prediction. Then you study the result it generated to actually get some insight. After you get some insight, you, 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 you get some better idea on how to improve your model. So uh, you go to train another model, <coughs> then do prediction, then do discovery. So this is really a, a cycle. Uh, but for our data miners, uh, the, start, the starting point is always the data. But uh, unfortunately, our data is not uh, always uh, very clean. Sometimes it can be as dirty as this, this kitchen sink. So uh, for example, you are given a thousand features, and you study those features, and you find, oh, actually a lot of those features are either relevant or redundant. So they are, not, they are useless for your predictive modeling. And also, uh, in real applications, many data by the nature are of very high dimensionality. Uh, for example, uh, tax data, genomic data, and medical image. So those, those kind of data you can easily get like uh, tens of thousand dimensionalities. So when the data has this high dimensionality, uh, we will have the problem of curse of dimensionality. So with this problem, uh, your, the, the training and the testing speed of your uh, model uh, decrease. The accuracy degenerate. And also even you can get a model because there are so many features. Uh, there are so many parameters in your model. This model will be very hard to interpret. So this is really a hard problem we need to address. So one of the very effective uh, techniques to address the curse of dimensionality is the feature selection uh, technique. So feature sh selection can actually reduce dimensionality by identifying and eliminating re uh, irrelevant and uh, redundant features. After you clean your data by removing those irrelevant and redundant features, uh, your model uh, your it will work faster, accuracy is improved, and also because you have less parameters in your model, uh, you can actually interpret, interpret you, you, your model very well. So this is actually a concrete case of less is more. So 
Feature selection has been a uh, like important research area for many years. And if in terms of supervision types, uh, we can uh, uh, largely categorize different feature selection algorithms as supervised feature selection algorithm and unsupervised feature selection algorithm. Uh, one, uh, also if you have partial label and a, and a large amount of label data, uh, you get the same supervised feature selection algorithm. And in this supervised feature selection uh, category, if your label is continu contains continuous value, you get a regression problem. And if your label is categorized, then you get a classification problem. Uh, so in this work, uh, we actually want to focus on very specific challenge that, that re recently raised for feature selection research. That's the big data problem. So in many real applications nowadays, uh, the data size is often in the, in the range of hundreds of gigabytes. And if you have a data of uh, terabyte, size is terabyte, this is just no time euro. So, uh, what is more is, uh, furthermore, is that the big data, your big data is actually becoming even bigger every year. So, statics uh, so that the amount of information uh, doubles every two years. So, you can, you can find uh, a lot of interesting information about big data uh, from this link from, from SAS. Okay, so uh, big data is a big, big opportunity because you have a lot of information. If you can actually mine those information, uh, you, you are guaranteed to find a lot of inter interesting things. Uh, but on the other hand, this is also a big challenge because if you have a data like, a, like a this size, right, hundreds of gigabytes, and use a single machine to analyze this data, it may take you several hours. Sometimes it, it may take you uh, even more than a day. So this is too slow. We definitely want to do something better than that. So the good news is that the hardware is actually also becomes more and more powerful. Uh, for example, uh, the, our supercomputer systems are twice as faster every two years. So if you compare the speed. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you compare the, uh, the speed here and the speed here, they are actually the same. Uh, but we need to realize that actually this kind of speed, speed up is largely due to the higher degree of parallelization. For example, one of the most powerful machine in this world is the Cary uh, Titan. So it, ha it contains like 18,000 uh, CPU and the GPUs and it can deliver 18 petabyte uh, flow bits of computer power. This is actually very super. But to utilize this, uh, utilize this uh, computer, uh, computing uh, infrastructure, we need to partition our big problems into many, many small problems, then do those problems uh, parallelly so we can gain this kind of power, power. Okay, so this slide actually shows some like a drawback of the existing algorithm. Uh, majorly it's like uh, those algorithms are designed for a centralized computing environment so they cannot utilize the most advanced distributed computing uh, technology. So to address this kind of limitation, uh, we developed a parallel uh, feature selection algorithm. You can use this algorithm in a distributed environment to handle a big problem in a very efficient and a scalable way. So I want to go directly to the formulation of uh, our algorithm. So this is the formulation of our, our algorithm. So uh, this may looks a little bit abstract, but uh, I will in, you know, interpret all how it works. So here you see this UN. So this UN is actually the basis of the non-space of the your selected feature. So basically, uh, you have you have this is your data. Then each column is a feature, right? So you want to select a set of features, and this set of features uh, forms X1. This is your select features. Then from your select features, you want to compute uh, its non-space. So this non-space is UN. Then this Z is your target matrix. Basically, it can be anything uh, of your interest. For example, in a re regression case, uh, this can be your uh, response matrix, right? So this is just the formulation for our algorithm. It's very simple. So basically, you project your response matrix to the non-space of the select features. So here, this is the stuff we call, for example, we can call this P. Then, uh, I forgot maybe. Turn this. Oh, this is turn off. Okay. So uh, you have this 
this is a P transpose, this is P, then you get a P transpose times P. So what does this mean? So basically, uh, you have your target matrix, you have your response matrix, whatever. Uh, then you project this matrix to the non-space of your selected features. Assume your feature, your, your, your Z is already centralized, then this P transpose P is actually the coherence, is a coherence matrix, but it's a special coherence matrix. This is the coherence matrix you obtain by first project your target matrix to the non-space of the select features, then uh, you do a, then you do a inner product, then you get your coherence matrix. Then if you take a trace of your coherence matrix, then you know what, what, what it measures. Basically, this will measure the variance of your target Z that cannot be explained by the features in X1. So why this is true? Because you, you already project your Z to the non-space of the features, right? So whatever remaining here is the thing that you cannot explain using your select features. So by minimizing this equation, this will end up by selecting a set of features that can jointly explain the maximum amount of variance in Z. Because you minimize the thing you cannot explain, then you actually maximize the thing you can explain. So this is, there is a dual duality relationship here. Then there are some good properties for this formulation. So the, the, first, uh, uh, the first advantage is that so this is very simple. Because it's so simple, we can very effectively to parallelize the computation of this formulation. Second of all, we have uh, like a, we didn't specify uh, what this J matrix should we should use, right? So actually, it turns out by defining this Z in different ways, this formulation can support feature selection for both supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And for supervised learning, uh, if you specify this Z in different way, we can also support feature selection for classification and regression. So first of all, uh, in an unsupervised setting, we just need to actually set this Z to X2. X2 is the features that hasn't been selected, right? So if you plug this X2 to here, then basically you want to select a set of features that can explain the maximum amount of variance containing in the unselected features. And if you, if you notice that if you project x1 to its own non-space, you actually get zero. You get nothing. So that means if you add, you can actually add x2 to here, uh, sorry, x1 to here, and x1 to here, then this formulation actually explain, want to select a set of features that can explain the maximum amount of variance of the whole data, not only the unselected, uh, unselected features, but the whole data. Okay. Then, in regression, in a regression case, it is even simpler. You, because in a regression case, you have the response matrix, right? You plug in this y into this formulation, then you get, uh, you get the, the way to, to actually select features in a regression uh, context. Then in classification context, we can actually construct a re regression uh, a response matrix uh, using this formulation and plug this formulation into uh, into, in, into this equation, and we can show actually this is equivalent to maximize the discriminant uh, criterion of linear discriminant analysis, so RDA. And uh, uh, very intuitively, uh, this will actually select a set of features. If you use this a set of features to study those samples, you find samples from the same class are very close to together, and if samples from different class, they are far away from each other. So basically, this is uh, the discriminant. Uh, discriminant uh, criteria of RDA. So we also implement some very efficient technique to compute uh, uh, this, the, uh, to, to optimize this problem uh, in a parallel way. So I will, I will ignore, I will like, uh, ignore, uh, omit that part because the limit of time. So we implement this algorithm as a SAS high performance analytical procedure called HP reduce. And this procedure supports both SMP mode and MPP mode. So here, by SMP uh, means uh, we can support a single machine with multiple cores. So this is very usual in our like uh, the computer. So we have multiple cores, and if you have a more 
powerful computer architecture like uh, you have a grid. We can also support that. So this is the MPP mode. So this is massively parallel processing mode. And also, uh, so sometimes you want uh, your I.O. to be very efficient. You come to distribute the database system, right? Uh, like uh, Green Plum Teradata and uh, also the Hadoop file system. So this, uh, this pr procedure also support to uh, those kind of uh, architectures. So you can load your data parallelly into memory. Then we can do computation in parallel and the general result very fast. So this is an example how to use this procedure. So basically, this line here, so you specify the grid host environment for running the procedure. And uh, you specify which is the input data and what is, which is the technique you want to use for computation. Then you specify uh, your model, basically what are, the, uh, what are the candidate features you want to study and how many features you want to select. Then you specify how many of the grid nodes you want to run, you want to uh, do the computation. Then you click run, it will run. So it will generate a result. So we also, uh, we want to study the performance of the procedure. So we compiled uh, our procedure with a bunch of uh, existing feature selection algorithms on like a 10 data set using many different uh, criteria. Uh, so there is a, like a summary of the result we obtained. So basically, in unsupervised case, in terms of explain the variance, uh, we win on all six of the six data sites. Uh, so for supervised learning, uh, for classification, in terms of accuracy rate, we win five of the six times. And for, re, for, for supervised learning regression case, uh, root mean square error, we win one of the two data sets. Basically, the, we compare with the Lauren and the Lasso. So we are comparable with Lauren and the Lasso. Uh, so this is also the redundancy rate of the select features by procedure HP reduces is always low. So basically, this result tells us that the procedure is able to effectively identify a set of very relevant features uh, with very low redundancy. We also want to study the scalability of algorithm. So this is actually the most uh, important part. So we, done, we tried this algorithm on a grid with uh, like uh, 208 nodes. So each node is uh, also a very powerful machine, like it has two CPUs. Each CPU has four cores, so basically on each node you, you get eight cores. Then it has 16 gig, gigabyte memory. Then we, our data is downloaded from Pascal Large Scale Learning Challenge. It's Epsilon and uh, OCR. This data, I think, is uh, very large, right? So if OCR whole, this is the whole data, contain training, validation, and a test. So it has uh, like a 5 million samples. It is uh, like a 50, megabyte, uh, 50 gigabyte of data. So uh, for this data, we tried uh, like to use 200 nodes. So if you use 200 nodes, like you are using like a 200 times 8 cores, like it's 1,800 cores. That's a lot of cores, a lot of computing power. Uh, so let's see the OCR, right? So here, this is the training. This is the time, a computing time. So for so this two plus is for unsupervised feature selection. This two plus is for supervised feature selection. And uh, here, the WAXO is running time in seconds. Then this x axis is the uh, number of nodes that we are using for the computing. Uh, so we can see, uh, so in general, uh, this is the running time, right? The more nodes you use, the less time. Uh, the, the, here, the time is the, the wall clock time, basically, right? So the less time you are using, then this is speed up ratio. Like uh, here is the speed up. The, the y axis is speed up. Then the x axis is the number of nodes. So we can see in general, so Unsupervised, supervised. So in general, the speed up ratio is uh, in, is linear. So for both supervised and supervised case, the overall speed up ratio is about uh, two point uh, point eight three. And uh, uh, we can see, like uh, uh, one, we use only a few nodes, like forty nodes. Then the speed up ratio is uh, almost like one. This is the ideal, very good. But when more nodes are used, we can see the speed up ratio actually decreases a little bit. So this is actually very reasonable because when more nodes are used, 
the warm up and the communication cost start to offset the increase of computing power. So uh, this is actually something like uh, uh, inevitable. Uh, okay, OCR epsilon. Yeah. So this comes to the conclusion. So basically, we develop a uh, uh, distributed parallel feature selection algorithm can work very efficiently, can handle very large scale problems in a very scalable way. Uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. <coughs> yes. Quick one. Um, so HP Reduce uses the BLOSS libraries. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, HP Reduce uses the BLOSS library package. Yes. Uh, so in order to get the most out of HP Reduce, do I need to recompile BLOSS for my specific computer, or just come built in? Uh, so uh, once so the that part is only for the S uh, so. For the on single node, you you have multi thread, right? So for the multiple thread, and once you receive it, this is already executable binary. So you install it, you don't need to compile; it will uh, do the parallel directly for you automatically. I have a question in in, uh, uh, in your uh, in your algorithm where you basically uh, were. Uh, Optimizing your trace mm -hmm. of uh, your UNZ, A T, mm -hmm. UNZ. Yeah. Now that assumes, of course, that that UN uh, that project uh, that projector assumes that you have already chosen your features. Exactly. Yes. So, in other words, that projection itself mm -hmm. enhanced the, uh, the 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 performance will depend on the features you choose. You're right. So, yeah. how how do you go about that? Yeah, so the question is basically, uh, before we can do, we can compute this uh, non-space, we need to know what are the features have been selected, right? right? So this actually comes to this slides so about the computation. So if you want to get the optimal solution, you need to try all the combinations, find the, the selected features, then use that, uh, use that formulation. So that will be... This problem is NP hard. You cannot address it. It's too expensive. So what we do is actually, uh, this is a very uh, standard and popular way is actually we do sequential forward selection. So this is a heuristic search method. So it's a greedy search method. So in each step, you select, uh, uh, among all the candidate kind of features, you select one of the best features, add this into your active site. We call this active site, your right. select features. Then you go to next step, you select another feature in this way. So for example, if you want to use this formulation, it will be, so here, this part will be actually the UN times UN transport, this part, right? So this, if we use this kind of ser search strategy, it will boil down to, like, uh, assume X1 contains the Q selected features in the Q step. Then in the Q plus one step, a feature is selected by you just need to append one, test each feature in the candidate site, then construct this part, then compute it. But this is actually not efficient enough. Then we, we actually de developed, we did some derivation. We derived a closed form solution to compute this, to minimize this. Turns out to minimize that equation is equivalent to maximize this equation. Then the benefit of this equation is that actually the most expensive part is actually something here and something here, they are shared by all the, fe all the candidate features. So f if you want to evaluate uh, like 10,000 features, you don't need to compute this 10,000 times instead of just one, one time shared by all the features. This actually greatly improves the uh, efficiency of the algorithm. And also, this is very simple. If you compare this algorithm for, uh, with the lasso, for example, lasso is uh, one of the most uh, like, uh, uh, important algorithm for like, a regression, right? sparse regression. And uh, the most uh, power, the most efficient solver for lasso is the quality green descent method. So this method will be actually by its nature is sequential. It's very hard to parallelize. And people like uh, the I think it's uh, from a uh, smaller group. They actually have some algorithm to parallelize this uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, 
green descent method by actually randomly select multiple colonies, then do the descent, then merge the result. But this is only good for like uh, you have like a multi power system. And if you have multiple machines, then to select 100 features, so, so for this algorithm, you only need 100 iteration. But for uh, less of for this quality green descent method, you may need like more than 100 iterations. Then the communication cost among the network will actually kill your performance. So uh, actually, this another advantage of this formulation is its simplicity. So it's very simple. The greedy, the greedy technique cannot be uh, more efficiently. Uh, I mean, the greedy technique. I, I, I assume mm -hmm. it's like a matching pursuit type of thing. You know, you grab things and. Mm -hmm. And you take the inner product and subtract the, 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 the but, and that cannot be implemented efficiently. <coughs> the greedy. The greedy. What oh, the greedy. The greedy yeah. A stochastic greedy in the method, you need to actually go through all the go through all the like the candidate features to update your uh, your weight matrix. Uh, you need to do that in random, otherwise you will not uh, actually uh, uh, achieve uh, your your optimal solution. In lasso, yeah, because it, it is a convex, right? You you want to convert to the global optimal. All right. Okay. Let's thank our speakers again. <laughs>